following interview was conducted with Byron Anderson for the Purdue University uh, Library's Oral History Program. It took place on Wednesday, um, June the 27th, 2007, in the TV studio in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Tell us a little bit about your parents and your early life and uh, early years in school, up through college. <clears throat> well, I was born in Winchester, Indiana, and I was the uh, first member of the family to go through college, to go to college, really. And uh, uh, I went through three years of high school and found out that during World War II you could uh, go on to college after three years in high school if your grades were good enough. So I elected that, which was in some ways a mistake because I really wasn't prepared for college, although I thought I was. So I came up to Purdue. And I had a very good friend that was here, had gone through the same thing from another school. That's how I happened to follow him um, to uh, Purdue. And um, after I got here, which was in the end of 1943, I was in a short course at Purdue for two months. And then I um, found that if I joined the Navy Air Corps, I could stay at Purdue for a year or two years and then go on to the fly to flying school. So I, was, oh, I just turned 17 years of age. So I told my parents, I said, if you sign this, <laughs> you won't have to pay anything for me to go to school. So I went through that procedure, went to Chicago, took some tests and passed. And, and it was, uh, they told me that I was in the Navy. It was called the Navy V-12A at the time. And so I was all ready to come back to Purdue until I got my orders that uh, Purdue was filled and I had to go to Newberry College in Newberry, South Carolina that I'd never heard of before. And I just, I told my father it had been a mistake and I was going to resign. <laughs> so he, he explained that he didn't think I was going to be able to do that. <laughs> and my mother's all upset. <laughs> so uh, I go to Newberry. With, there was about seven or eight people from Purdue, I found out, that were on the train with me. And uh, I really enjoyed it down there after, after I got used to it and uh, used to the different Southerners of that particular time because it was a different, uh, different culture in the South in 1943, even during the war. Sure. And so uh, after a year, well, then I uh, transferred to a pre-flight school for, in the Navy. And that was the University of North Carolina. And I loved it there. As a matter of fact, I even thought maybe I wanted to go back to school there. So I found out when the war was over, there was none of my friends <laughs> there, and all my friends would be back at Purdue, and of course, they're all writing me about their getting out and hope to see you soon and this type of thing. So I easily came back to Purdue, and uh, I, uh, I remember uh, Fred Hubdy was, uh, was not president yet. Dr. Elliott had left, and uh, I think he, he still had an office here, but... Uh, the Dean of Engineering, um, Dean Potter, was uh, acting president at the time. <clears throat> and uh, when uh, Dr. Hubdy arrived, I happened to be on campus that day, and I remember seeing him. And he was a young, I think he was about 45 or 46, which is pretty young for a president, especially at that time, right, sure. at a place like Purdue with all the older people they've had as presidents over the years, in the past anyway. And... Um, um, I was very taken with him, and I think everybody was. And he, I turned out to, to know him quite well later on, and mm -hmm. he was, I think, a wonderful man. And when uh, Dr. Bering was, when we asked Dr. Bering to be president, uh, um, uh, Dr. Hubdy was still living here in Lafayette, and he wasn't, he wasn't too well at the time. But uh, I was asked if I would keep in touch with him because they knew that I knew him sure. and had some relationship with him. And so I'd go out to his house and talk to him about the people we were talking to. And he was very enthusiastic about Bering at the time. He thought we were going the right direction, okay. very happy to see this. Okay. And by the time Bering became president, uh, Dr. Hovde was in the hospital. And I remember um, um, Dr. Bering went to the hospital to see him. He probably talked about this not in his interview. Not not not, yeah. no, uh-uh. Anyway, um, so that that's the beginning around Purdue. Okay, uh, let me backtrack. What was the college? What was campus like? You lived on campus, and were you in a fraternity or? I was in a fraternity. I uh -huh. was in the 
in the Kappa Sigma fraternity, and uh, the campus was smaller than the campus at Fort Wayne. Uh, in other words, it was only about 15,000 students. <clears throat> and there was, and at that, with the 15,000, there were a, a number of Navy people here. They called them V-12s. And they, the Army had some people here at the time, too, and then they had a flight school out here, and they were mostly uh, uh, foreign people in the flight school. I, I don't remember the details sure. of it. Sure. Uh -huh. But um, it was a much smaller university, and, and um, but it was, uh, I thought, a great place at the time. And, of course, the war is on, and everything's different, and you're on rationing and so forth, and you can't get gasoline. It's hard to go anyace. And uh, nobody had any money anyway. What were some of the social activities? Things sort of did it revolved around the union, didn't they? Were they yeah, activities? it was all involved around the union. Sure. This was the center of activity. Sure. And then when I came back, I got out of the, uh, the service right after the war because they didn't need any more Navy flyers. The war is over, and they're dumping airplanes in the ocean. And <laughs> <laughs> so, so I came back at that time, and, and uh, I mean that was you know the war was over in September of 1945. Sure. And at the end of September, I was signed up in Purdue, and I think it started the 1st of October. They had a, an interest session, I think the term was at the time. Uh -huh. Every two months, they were taking people in. Anyway, I, I started right, right, right away, and of course, I knew a lot of people from being here a short time before. And um, it was, uh, if you didn't have a, a, a uniform on, you were really <laughs> sort of out of place. <laughs> Well, there must have been a lot of them. Because that. nobody had any money to buy any clothes. And so we just wore our uniforms. You know, they were not the, exactly the way we were supposed to wear them, yeah. but everybody wore a uniform. There were a lot of Air Force people here at the time. I remember that. And some, and some Navy. And then they still had the Navy V-12 unit here. Huh. And, even uh, after the war? Even after the war for about a year, I think it was, uh -huh. before it was terminated. And uh, Dr. Elliott, as I recall, was very instrumental in, in starting and running the administration of that all over the country. Mm -hmm. I know he was one of the key people in it. Sure. So that probably had something to do with the number of peoples they had they here. here. And, and uh, they had, they had a, uh, some women, and they were taking uh, different courses, and I don't remember exactly what it was. Mm -hmm. I never talked or knew any of the girls. That what were was the there. athletics? Were you to go to the games, or what was the athletics? Oh, yeah, Some I went to, there. Well, <clears throat> after the war, when I came back, I never missed a, a football game or a basketball game. And that's when we had the bleacher crash in, the, um, in Mackey Arena. All, the, all their bleachers fell down. Wasn't it, in, it was that Lambert or Mackey? No, it was in Lambert. Lambert, because yeah. Ma uh, Mackey, I think, yeah, it was, was before Mackey. Before Mackey, in Lambert Fieldhouse. Mm -hmm. The bleachers fell down, and four or five people were killed. Mm -hmm. And I was in the bleachers that night, but I was on a lower level, and it was on the other side. Oh, so wow. I was very fortunate. Yes, you were. Because I knew one of the people, several people that were hurt quite badly for, yeah. and had some lasting effects of, with that. And, of course, the uh, papers said, well, one of... of America's premier engineering schools just lost their bleachers, and it wasn't funny, but, but it, it... When you see a, a headline like that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. it does catch your... That's right. Mm -hmm. Anyway, they had, we had pretty good teams at the time mm -hmm. in football and basketball. Sure. And you had the, well, the uh, Boilermaker Special was still over there. Some of the, uh, you had Block P, some of those. Didn't you have some other... They had, but the, uh, the band was a military band. <clears throat> I mean, they... They were like a regimental military band, and they sure. all wore uniforms like a, they were in the Army, and everything was very strictly uh, Army. And they, I know the director of the band was Spots Emmerich. I, I recognize his name. Yeah. yeah. And so that was the atmosphere around here. But one of the nice, one of the things that I, <laughs> I remember that was a nice atmosphere in Purdue at that time was that uh, that was the era of the big bands. There's like Jimmy Glenn, Dorsey, I mean, those big bands. Tommy that, Dorsey, yeah. Jimmy Dorsey, Glenn Miller, sure. and, and many other people like that. And they were here all the time. Wow. Um, I know one night we had a, uh, the Glenn, Glenn Miller Orchestra, he was killed. But Glenn Miller was killed. He was killed during the war, but his band still stayed together right after the war. And he was in, uh, in the field, in, uh, in the uh, music hall. Uh, for a, I don't know, it was six o'clock uh, show, I guess, 
And then after that, we came over to the, um, I had a date that night, and then we came over to the union building, and they had, um, I think it was Tommy Dorsey. That's pretty good. <laughs> it really was. <laughs> right. yeah. In today's times, that's wonderful. It's hard to get bands here to come now. Did they have Did they have Victory Varieties then, or was that later? Remember the V Square? No, that started. Yeah, oh, it started at that time. At too, that right? time is when it started, as I recall. Uh huh. And they but it was going moment. right at well, like when I got back, I guess sure. it was it was going. I think it started just before that. <clears throat> and uh, one of my fraternity brothers was uh, in the Kappa Sigma fraternity. He sang in the Glee Club. And that's when, I um, um, can't think of his name right now, he was the leader. Oh, um, Stewart. Al Stewart. Al Stewart, Al Stewart. yeah, right. Al Stewart uh -huh. was the leader. Right. And he was a very fine singer at his first job out of Purdue. Al now, Stewart? Well, was with, with Stewart. His first job, and I found out just uh, in the last year, I was talking to him, and he says, you know, that really wasn't my first job. I went to Indiana and learned how to sing. <laughs> They told me I didn't know how to sing, and so I had to go to Indiana for two years. <laughs> but but then he was the uh, he was in the the original cast of um, South Pacific in New York. Wow! And he spent all of his life in the in that in show business really. Sure. And I used to go see him in Chicago when he was, he was up there with Betty Davis one time. Oh wow! And uh, another person I had in the fraternity that's well known. He's well known to some of us, but not too many people around here. His name was is Benny Modelson. He lives in Denmark, and um, several years ago, maybe in the late '80s, uh, we were in Denmark with Dr. Bering, and we had a. It was the Purdue President's Council cruise, starting out in in um, Copenhagen, and um, I arranged for Benny to come down and have Benny Modelson to come down and have um, lunch with us. And uh, he won the Nobel Prize. Oh my! And that, that name didn't ring a bell, but that's yeah. very. What did he, and for what? Physics. Physics. Yeah, but after he left here, he started working with Niels Bohr. And oh. if you read the book Einstein, that's just out, mm -hmm. which I've enjoyed. I'm just about halfway through it. It's a little difficult to read, to read all that. Right. <laughs> I Good wasn't fun. a physics major anyway. <laughs> Takes a little time. Yeah. So uh, uh, he. Uh, one of his cohorts was Niels Borg. I think it's B O R H uh, mm -hmm. is the spelling. Mm -hmm. B Borg of the, the Geo yeah. Borg, and um, that's where Benny started working. But he spent all his summers in um, on atomic things down at, uh, in uh, the Southwest in the United States. In Los Alamos. So he was here all the time, and his wife was uh, from Chicago, and she had graduated from Purdue too. Mm -hmm. So they, they were just regular people. Uh, very well. That's a, that's a nice little addition. To yeah. It. Did um, in your family? Did you meet your wife? Uh, your you're married? Did you meet your wife here? Yes. Uh -huh. doing, okay. I did. And My first wife. Oh, okay. Yeah, she died in, in 1999. Okay. And um, her um, father was a professor. He was the first professor in um, agricultural engineering that Purdue had. He actually actually graduated from Purdue in about 1917 or something like that. And uh, he, would, he graduated in civil engineering and then transferred to the Ag School and started the, he didn't really start it, he was just the first professor there. Mm -hmm. And became the head yeah. of the... So my, the, my wife had gone to, through high school here. I got to know a lot of the local people in West Lafayette and Lafayette sure. because of her and um, still know some of those people and where they are. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we were married, we both graduated in 1948 and were married at the same, married in 1948, within a few months after we graduated. I see. And then that brings me to the next thing. What about, what was your career path in following college? Well, I, um, I was in the aeronautical school and it... That's it, where you got your degree in aeronautics? Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. And uh, it was actually, I, the last... And during the, the, my junior year, I decided I did not want to be a, a, a um, work on a, um, at that time I found out the only jobs available because they really weren't building airplanes. We, don't, we didn't need any airplanes. They just threw about 2,000 of them in the ocean. <laughs> but I, there was a job available at Boeing and the jobs that the people from Purdue were taking were all on drafting boards. Well, that didn't appeal to me at all. So I went into the dean and said, I'm, I'm, I don't want this kind of a degree. 
And he said, now, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I really want to get into sales work of some type. That's, that sort of intrigues me. And Of course, I thought I could go to Boeing and sell airplanes. It didn't exactly <laughs> door work to that Door to door. Yeah. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> and uh, um, um, so I transferred into this air transportation group, and I took some business courses and dropped some of the engineering courses. But when I got out of school, I followed the engineering path more than I ever thought I would. And uh, I went to work with General Motors in Dayton, Ohio. And then I, from there, I, uh, um, uh, I left there and got into it uh, with another company out east. But um, uh, I, and then I went to Rhode Island and was with a, a company in Providence, Rhode Island. But I transferred back here. And I was, I became what they called their, uh, their um, engineering uh, salesperson in the central part of the United States. For this company in Rhode Island? In Rhode Island, mm -hmm. yeah. And um, uh, the doctor, um, Dr. Potter, I mentioned, mm -hmm. they called him Dean Potter. Sure. Dean Potter had done a lot of research work with him. And so I, through him, I... That was sort of a connection. I had never known D Dean Potter in school. I'd seen him, but I sure. didn't have any classes with him or anything like that. But that was, uh, he found out that I was with that company, and that sort of helped me, I think, because he would ask about certain people. I'd tell him I just saw Dean Potter. Anyway, um, I, I um, was involved with the design of the uh, <coughs> chemical, uh, chemical feed equipment for the city of Chicago for their new water treatment plant. And I was working with a number of consulting engineers representing this company, and they ended up purchasing all this equipment. And it was a, quite a large uh, order. And of course, it was a big thing in the country at that time. And that really got me into that field. That was water treatment. And then I found out that waste treatment was even more interesting. I've got sort of an algae here, and I'm having trouble with it. And uh, uh, so I was with... Uh, uh, <clears throat> with this company for about five years, and I found out that most of my work was working with consulting engineers all over the Midwest, mainly in Chicago, but some in Indianapolis and Louisville and St. Louis and Detroit, and I traveled a great deal doing that. And I decided I wanted to live here because I thought it would be a great place to live in a college town, and my wife's family were here, and so that's why we came back here. And um, I, f I started thinking about the fact that I'd like to work for myself. And then why couldn't I do what I was doing on my own? And um, the company then offered me a job as what they called assistant sales manager for the country, and this was a big promotion. I was, I was still pretty young, uh, too young for the job, really. And um, I said, uh, I don't want it. And they were very taken aback. And I told them what I wanted to do. I was going to go off on my own. And they said, well, you won't have any contacts because you, know, you can't work with us. You've just left us. Well, I had thought about that, and I had some ways around it, and that's kind of a long story. But it worked out wonderfully, and then eventually I had a contract with this company as I was just a contract agent with them. Mm -hmm. And I um, ended up uh, starting the business here in, in West Lafayette, and I ended up with a number of people. I built a building out in the research park, and we, uh, uh, and it's still going. As a matter of fact, I got out of it in 1994. And I worked a little bit after that for a couple of years, but uh, it's still a going business. It's still out there. I think they're going to move because they're, it's the building's too small, and so oh. they're moving to a less expensive place over over in the east side. They really wanted to go to Indianapolis, and the, most of their personnel are in Indianapolis now, as they were even when I was working with them. Uh -huh. But uh, uh, the, the person that runs it, why well, he wants to stay here, so that's fine. It's, it goes under my name. Sure. So he gives me caps and, and, and that have B.L. Anderson on them, <laughs> which I think is hilarious myself. Anyway, that's my background. But in order to do that, I really didn't have all the engineering I needed. So I actually hired uh, professors who I said, I haven't got time to take your course because I can't come over and sit in those classes at that particular time. I'm busy. Can I hire you at night? And I would go to their homes. And I took several engineering courses, uh, 
in the field that I was in this way. To fill in what you, yeah. uh, the course of the, that you didn't, hadn't taken, which would yeah. be appropriate as to your business. Mm -hmm. Very good. So I did get the engineering background. As a matter of fact, the, the uh, Indiana Society of Engineers said that I could get a, I could get a, a, a license. And I said, I don't want a license because I work with engineers, and if I had a license, they'd have to pay me, and they don't want to pay me. And they know who I am, and they know my ability. And so, I don't it, need the license. Right? It also be, almost became, well, it was detrimental if I went ahead sure. and did that. Right. So the point was that I, I became pretty well qualified in that, in that field in, in the design and operation of water and waste treatment plants. Also worked with industry. I worked with General Motors quite a bit in some of their early uh, uh, pollution control uh, projects. Worked with Eli Lilly, even the one here in town when it started. Mm -hmm. So that was the kind of thing I did. Very good. Yeah. Now we, we got to um, the Board of Trustees. You first got on in 81, and you're one That's of right. the three alumni uh -huh. trustees. Yeah. And uh, at that time, as a research I was doing, had, you were the next local person since Maury, Maury Kanoy. Uh, yes. Been on the, so uh -huh. that was very nice. So tell us a little bit about some of the things that uh, the trustees, some, you were on some of the committees and work a little bit you know, you're involved. Well, you know, I got involved through the Alumni Association mm -hmm. and uh, spent a lot of time with that. And um, I became well acquainted with Joe Rudolph, who was the uh, executive director of the Alumni Association. You and were with the Alumni Association before you were on the trustees? Oh, yes. Okay. And then I was appointed by the Alumni Association to the Board of Trustees. And okay. that's a rather long story. I don't know if you want to well, hear all that. Give us a snapshot if you like. Well, okay. uh, because um, I usually ask people their involvement in the alumni association, yeah. which you had, which I knew. Yeah, you quite, said, quite and, a bit at the time. And I spent, I was on the board for several years, and um, um, if you became a vice, you came, became a vice president, I think it's still the same, a vice president for two years, a president for this two years. This is the board of trustees you're talking about? No. Oh, the, the, alumni? the alumni association. Okay. okay. Two years as past president, then you're president, then two years or two years as vice president, two years as president, two years as past president. So it's a six-year operation, which I went through and um, um, learned a lot about their operation. I traveled some uh, for them and with them and, and uh, got to know a lot of the alumni around the country. And I, of course, I was very aware that they had three trustees and uh, really had no even thoughts of being uh, on the board of trust trustees. And they may be chairman to select, and this is rather an unusual situation, uh, and maybe I should admit it, but it happened this way. Um, I almost appointed myself because there wasn't any other person they wanted. <laughs> um, These things happen. <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, we asked a man in Indianapolis by the name of Henry Ryder, who was later appointed by the governor on the Board of Trustees. And he was a friend of mine, he was in school with me. And he knew this Peter Smith, the fellow who became quite well known in the, as the actor. Anyway, uh, Henry called me back and he said, well, I really appreciate you asking me to do this for the Alumni Association. He said, I'd love to do it, but I can't. I just was, became president of the Indianapolis Symphony and I don't have time. He was a lawyer, and he said, that's going to take all my time. I just can't do it. So I went back to the committee, and I said, we got a problem. We can't, we, he can't take the job, and we didn't have a second choice. And so they came to me and said, you're the second choice. <laughs> so as a second choice, I, was, uh, uh, I took Bob Heine's place. Bob Heine was a man who had been on the Board of Trustees. I'm not really sure how long, but I think 10 or 15 years. Uh -huh. And that's the way it went, it has over the years. The people who are trustees from the Alumni Association have a longevity on the, on the uh, which you need some of, but they have a longevity on the, on the Board of Trustees uh, because they can be reappointed. By the Alumni Association? By the Alumni Association. Okay. And uh, usually it goes through, uh, through the officers. Now, it's, you actually vote for it, but it's usually down to one person. They're trying to get this to two people, and in, Indiana University is a good example. They have three or four people, and it becomes a real, I guess the best word is a rat race down there. 
to get on from the alumni representative on the board. Yeah, and they, if people have different ideas of why they wanted to get on. They're not. It's not sometimes in the best interest of the university, but it's worked wonderfully well here, and uh, it still operates that way. Right. Do you get reappointed? Uh, is it a, was it a three-year term, and then you can get reappointed? Yes. Is that how it comes? Uh, I was. I took uh, Bob Heine's place, and in, in, uh, actually it was December of 1981, and. Uh, my first meeting of the Board of Trustees was Art Hansen's last meeting as president. Oh, okay. He resigned that day. Of course, I told him he resigned because I came on the Board of Trustees. <laughs> I, had, I had a lot of fun kidding him about that. And uh, another, I'm going to back up a little bit because yeah. this, I think, is important. Good. It was Art Hansen that started the development office at Purdue. And he knew he would have to go through the Alumni Association to get it done, and they uh, Huffy never had to raise funds at the university, and Hanson came in and um, realized, well, you, we, we needed some fundraising, and he saw how other schools were doing it, and we needed a de development office, but he had to have help with the Alumni sure. Association. And this was a very controversial thing, and the reason it was controversial is the Alumni Association never raised money and didn't want to. They wanted to stay out of it. and. Uh, uh, Art was, uh, he was divorced at the time, um, right after he came here. And I was uh, president of the Alumni Association, so he and I would meet for breakfast and talk about how we could work the Alumni Association with the operation of a new development office. So that was the beginning of the development office. I don't think very many people know that. Joe Rudolph can vouch for that, that yeah, that's the way it good, That's a good thing because we're thinking of a lot of things that researchers studying the university yeah. uh, can glean from these interviews. That's yeah. really the focus. Uh -huh. That's very good. Um, well, then it was Steve Baring that took over after Hansen had started well, the development you, was office. There, then the uh, national search, when you came on the board, is that when the search started yes, for, uh -huh. the re, for the replacement? Yeah. Was, uh, was somebody put in the interim when Dr. Hansen was uh, there, when John Hicks The was interim there? was... Uh, uh, was that John, Hicks? John Hicks. Okay, he I was, thought there he was, was an interim in between acting there. president for a year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, some of the uh, and then you were vice president of the board in '89. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, one of the committees I noticed that you were on was the construction committee. I spent most of my time working with the uh, construction committee, and I really enjoyed that. And it was something that I had some experience in because my work was all with architects, engineers, and sure. contractors. And uh, Jesse was too, as a matter of fact. Uh -huh. So the two of us had a lot of experience in how those things are done. And the time I was on 14 years, and of that 14 years, Purdue spent 50 million dollars, an average of 50 million dollars a year on construction. Now, up until the last few years, I thought that was a lot of money. <laughs> but now it's, it was for then those days. It was for time. those days. Yeah. Sure. Now it's See, a little had, everything had to put in, you know, perspective. perspective like I built right. this building for X amount of dollars. But in 1950 dollars, and then that's key. That's right. Uh -huh. Yeah, right. Um, let's see. Uh, some of the other some of the other things that the trustees are involved in quite a few things. Were you involved? The mm -hmm. search the search takes quite a bit of time. Were you on the search? For yes, I, I was. As a matter of fact, I, and I since I just come on the board, I was kind of surprised to be involved in it. But a lot of it had to do with the fact I lived here. And I was accessible to everybody, sure. both in the university and outside the university. Right. And uh, the president of the board of trustees lived up in, the, in I call it the region, which is up in the Hammond area. It's, it's another, it's a suburb of Hammond. I can't think of the name right now. He's still there, and and uh, he would come down here. And I know several times he had an airplane, and I had an airplane, and I, so I like flying, and he liked flying. Hanson liked flying. I can tell you a lot of stories about Hanson. I understand something I read. He did. <laughs> yeah. He flew, didn't he, while he was here. That's right. Yeah. He learned to fly here. Yeah, he did. Yeah. That's right. And I helped him out doing that and, you know, <laughs> telling him what to do and where to go. And, and then we flew some of the same airplanes. Well, anyway, that's a whole other... We talk a long time about that. Uh, but uh, because of his airplane, he'd fly down here or I'd fly up there. And we flew around the country to see different people that were interested in the job. Did you use an outside uh, firm at that? Yes, we you did. did. Uh -huh. okay. But they really didn't. That's not where the, that's not where Bering came from. The name came from uh, 
uh, Andrews, Dr. Andrews was the, was the dean. Is this of, Fred Andrews? Fred Andrews, uh -huh. yeah. Uh -huh. And he would come to my office and say, you know, the only person for this job is Steve Byrne. He's the dean of the medical school in Indianapolis. I said, Indiana University? I, I don't think that would sell around here. <laughs> and and, and he, then I found out he was going to Art Hans, uh, um, Art Hans, um, Don Powers was the president of the Board of Trustees. At this time. And he was going to Powers saying the same thing, come to sit me and say the same thing, but he didn't tell us this. We found out by talking collectively that he's, he was in each of our offices about every few days. <laughs> he was really a promoter for Beering. And so we thought, well, we, ought, we have got to at least talk to this man. And so Don said, well, I'll come down and pick you up and we'll fly to Indianapolis and, and, and we'll meet this guy. That's the way he put it, I think, in those words. This guy, like, who was this? He didn't know who he was. So we went to Indianapolis. Because never, neither of you had met him before at all. No. Well, I, Powers did meet him. He said he had a Coca-Cola with him in the, in the uh, hospital, I guess, at, uh, in the lobby of the hospital in the, the IU Medical Center. But that's the only time he had with him. And he said, uh, I think we ought to talk to him. I want to get your opinion on him. So... Joe Dawson, who lived in Indianapolis, Bob Jesse from uh, from um, uh, Fort Wayne came down, and myself and Don Powers, and then we had a, a faculty member. Um, I should be calling his name. I haven't thought about him for a long time, but he went with us. Mm -hmm. In fact, he uh, he I think he flew down with us, and we uh, had dinner with Dr. Barry in the. Uh, in the Columbia Club in Indianapolis on the Circle, still there. And uh, we were all very much taken with Dr. Burring that night, very much so. Then the big question came, how would he be accepted at Purdue? Well, we found there were some problems because he did not have a PhD. And I never knew of the importance of a PhD until we got into that with Dr. Burring. And having a medical degree as a doctor and having a PhD according to any faculty, it's not just at Purdue, it's just the way the business is, um, that's really not acceptable. And they let the trustees know about it. And uh, first of all, we had to get their approval. We didn't want to... Well, excuse me, Leon, was there, there was a search committee of which the trustees were on. So this was part of the search committee. You were yeah. part of the search. Like first of all, we had, we had to sell the search committee. All right. So similar that they've done for Everybody. replacement for Jesky. There was fa trustees and faculty and yeah. students, whatever. And okay. all these people were involved. Sure. And uh, so we were. We just made the initial contact. Sure. And the uh, what I did out of that was to go to Rudolph and I said, I got to take you in my confidence, Joe. I said, How do you do? You think you could sell a man like this to the alumni? Because he did not have an engineering background. At that time, you know, that was very important. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, it still is today, as sure, a matter of fact. Sure. Our new president is well-versed in engineering. Right. And uh, she fits perfectly. <laughs> she, she fits the model better than anybody I've ever seen here. <laughs> anyway. Um, well, Dr. Jeske has his degree in engineering. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. right. Yeah. Air, and air, he was uh, an aeronautical engineer, right. as you know, in the background. But sure. he also, after all, he was president of Iowa State University, and then he was a he was a provost at uh, Missouri, I believe, or Oklahoma. He, no, he'd been in Oklahoma, too, yeah. as well. Uh -huh. So he had a, quite a background in sure. the administrative uh, area. Now, uh, Beering did, too, in that, uh, and that's one thing we, th we thought was very important. He knew the university, and he knew, Purdue, he knew the, uh, the university in Indiana. He knew the legislature. That was very important. Right. He knew how Indiana operated, and he knew that Purdue operated the same way. He had a lot of contacts with Purdue because he set up a medical school operation for all over the state. With the two got years Purdue here. involved. Right. So he was, he was very well acquainted with everything that Purdue did, how they operated, and that's really why he became very interested in the job. He saw some things at Purdue that he hadn't seen in Indiana. Uh, he never said this, but it was all very plain. <laughs> that, that, that had a lot to do with his interest in the job because sure. he obviously became very interested in it. And I think Fred Andrews had a lot to do with that because hadn't been for Fred Andrews, why Dr. Bering would I don't think have even been uh, considered. But Fred Andrews was on a, 
was on a uh, board of directors of a small operation in Indianapolis that Steve was on. And that's how he knew him, became well acquainted with him. They'd worked together. And They'd worked together. And of course, even they, they lived next door, oh, really next door to each other when Dr. Bering was president. And, and, uh, um, I, and I became very well acquainted with Fred, Dr. Andrews, Fred Andrews. And uh, Bering and I saw him the day before he died. Hmm. Because we've talked about this in, in different you know, at different times, so Fred was very very important to the university more than most people realize. Mm -hmm. uh, and important to the background of the university with uh, the president. So that's that's how he came. Then you he came became the president, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, let's we're watching our time. We okay? Yeah, we're all, all right. Fine. Um, See, what are some of the, you, on the construction, that, that involves getting a lot of the uh, working with the getting the, the bids in and things of that sort. A lot of that work has to be done prior to bringing it before the trustees as far as the contracts are concerned. Is that correct? Well, or the major <clears throat> yes, but the, the, there's things? a lot of planning that goes on. And uh, Purdue has, has a, an excellent planning operation. And I had been somewhat familiar with it because I had heard... Uh, uh, contractors, architects in particular, and uh, and the contractors talk about the bidding process at Purdue and how tough it was, and that uh, Scholler was the only architect that Purdue had at the time, and the architects in Indiana were really upset about that. They should, somebody else should have a chance at it, and this type of thing, and it was the public operation, and it should be open to the public, and they should be able to bid on it. And, mm -hmm. And they hit me with this right away. And I got into some real problems with that as the chairman of the... Of that committee. Of that committee. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, that took a little undoing. We actually did have it bid, but uh, Scholler knew so much about it that um, if the price is anything close to each other, why we wanted them to have it because it was so much easier for the university. Plus the fact that when they built, they said it's still the same way. I've just been through the new Armstrong Hall, and you can see it over there. It hasn't changed. They're very, very uh, strict. And, and uh, Fred Ford and I used to talk about this and the reasons for it and how it was operated. They're very strict about holding to the letter of the law and the, and the contract, and uh, uh, they have inspectors like nobody else has. Uh, we've got the faculty, the, the right. facilities here to do that. And so they're, they're the poor contractor, he can't make a wrong move. Now, you build a house and nobody's watching some of the things they do, for example. But when you build at, the, at Purdue University, somebody's looking down there <laughs> on everything anybody does, and it's a tough thing to do. I mean, it's tough for the contractors. And the contractors would complain about that. So those were some difficulties that I went through. And uh, uh, it caused me some problems because I, uh, the inference was, and it was never direct, but the inference was if you want to do business like I do in Indianapolis, you've got to deal through the architects and the, co and the engineers. And you've been successful at it. Don't you want to remain successful? You know, they've, all kinds of things were pulled. Well, of course, that just made it worse. <laughs> <laughs> I see what you're saying. Oh. Yeah, so I spent a lot of time with that. And, and, uh, but there was a lot of planning before these jobs came to Purdue. The planning was in, in the stage that, uh, well, you've seen it here in the recent buildings. Right. The, uh, they, they, first of all, before they plan a building, they, it hasn't changed. The, uh, uh, the administration has to go to the trustees and say, we want to build this building, and here's the size we need, and, and this is the background of why we need it, and so forth, before they ever have an architect mm -hmm. to design it. And then you go through that procedure, and this takes several years. So some of the jobs that I was involved in um, would last six or seven or eight years from the, the time of conception until the building was built. Mm -hmm. But it was very interesting to me, and uh, I really loved uh, doing, that, doing that part of it. And you'd had some work, uh, similar yeah. things that you were doing, so it worked out really well Yeah, it worked you. out quite well. You, you and I was that. right here in town. Right. 
it had it had uh, been in the in the city of Lafayette had a lot of advantages and disadvantages. Uh, the advantages were it was easy for anybody to call me up or contact me. But I uh, I found I had I didn't want to make myself too available because I would hear all the problems and some of them I didn't want to hear. It works both sides of the It works point. both ways, yeah. Right, yeah. Um, one of the things that uh, was new that was on the board before you came in, the student trustee started in 75. Oh, yes. Uh, well, actually, the student trustee started before I before came on the board. Right, but that, that was a it new was dimension. New. It right. was new, yes. Uh -huh. And uh, they've continued on with that, and it, evidently it's worked very, you know, it's they're hard to get uh, when they narrow it down. And <laughs> Well, I tell you, I think it's better now than it was. Oh, uh -huh. uh, well, there were some difficulties. When it initially got started? Yeah. Oh, uh-huh. Um, I was frankly not, not after, I didn't think much about it until I got on the Board of Trustees, but my first few experiences were not good. And uh, just to tell you what happened, Dr. Bering was uh, to be named president, and the trustees all voted on it officially, and we said we would not mention this to anybody. And the student trustee told the newspaper in Montpelier, Montpelier in uh, Monticello. And I asked him about this the next day. I said, why did you do that? And he said, well, I didn't think anybody would find out about it. They're up in Monticello. Well, that just shows you having a student on the trustees being rather naive. He didn't mean anything about it, but it sure upset a lot of us that uh, he I did this. I recall that one, yes, right. But, uh, but the people they have on now, I think that the Especially some of these recent women are just outstanding. Very, very yeah. good. I've yeah. had a chance to meet some of them. Which They're is really way nice. ahead of the people right. that we had back. Right. But we had some good ones back then. Oh, yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Um, General Assembly, you work. You have to get the budget and you send it on to the to the, and that that takes a lot of work too, doesn't it? Uh, the capital budget and things of that sort. Yes, it does. Right. Uh -huh. Now I never worked uh, with the General Assembly directly. Of course, they had people that did that and still do, as sure. far as well, I you know. Were, the budget, it goes to the budget committee first, though, doesn't it, in Indianapolis before it gets yes, to the uh -huh. assembly? And right. the, from the trustees, it goes down there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, one of the other things, that, a couple other things that you were involved in, that the trustees are involved in, the benefits, you know, working on the flexible benefits for the faculty and staff, and those have certainly changed over time. Yes, they have. Trying to, uh, to keep <laughs> current, uh, having been here for a long time, I... Yeah. experienced some of those, but it's worked out. And one of the things that when you were there, they wanted, they used to be just TIA and CREF, and they uh, opened up the options for yes. other things. And, and I was I was involved in that uh -huh. particular situation uh, with TIA and CREF. And uh, <clears throat> of course, one side being the equity side and the other side being the uh, bond side. Um, and the problem with the faculty came about because the faculty wanted access to that's their uh, that's their pile of money, and so they should have access to it and be able to do with what they wanted to, and the university was keeping them from from that, and I had just experienced that in business, and I said legally you can't do it. You got they have it's theirs if they really want it. In other words, be able to withdraw it. Is that what? Yes. You're, oh, uh -huh. Okay. And uh, prior to retirement, because you can take it out. You could take it out when you're retired, though, couldn't you? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But, was, the, but they want access prior to that. Because they didn't like the maybe what TIA craft was doing, and they wanted to, to put it someplace else. Okay. So withdraw, That's really what they wanted to, to do. To reinvest, take my money, and I'm going to reinvest Yeah, I want to invest it in these CDs, kind of things. Sure. Okay. And so that took a lot of doing and some meetings and so forth. And the Craner, some people in the Craner School who were very astute at this type of thing, they, they were the people that we had to convince uh, that uh, there was a problem and we had to do it correctly. But they, they really got it changed, mm -hmm. and they should have gotten it right. changed. Yes, I was, I I was right. all for that. Yeah. A um, couple other things. You got the fall break started in 1985, the, the, the fall break that they didn't used to have. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the regional campuses, how they've, they've changed over time, haven't they? Well, yeah, I, I never had any idea that... Uh, the trust re trustees were so involved with regional campuses till I got on the board. But we had uh, uh, one of our meetings, we'd have 12 meetings a year, and sometimes we'd have more than that. 
but one of them was always with the, each of the regional campuses, and that meant Indianapolis, Fort Wayne, oh, Michigan City, campus. and uh, and uh, uh, Hammond campus, and uh, well, that was it. Uh, we had uh, we had facilities in southern Indiana, and we did go down there one time, I remember. But we kept in pretty close touch with those people, and I got I think all of us got to know the the chancellor of each of those places quite well. And uh, we spent a lot of time in Fort Wayne because that's one of the biggest ones. And the Indiana University campus, which is IU PUI, in the Indianapolis. In, is Indianapolis. The administration is Indiana University. But in Fort Wayne, it's uh, it's PUIU FW I -P -F -W or something like that. IPFW, isn't that yeah. it? Were the administration, so we were spending more time with them than we were in Indianapolis, mm -hmm. and um, and it became a larger school. Of course, now as I said, it's bigger than well, I think it's twenty thousand people up there in Fort I, Wayne. I think I read that recently. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. It was fifteen thousand when I uh, about the time I left the board, which is in the mid ninety ninety five, and. Uh, was your when you left the board? Was your time up, or was how did how did how did you how do you get off the board? You, well, <clears throat> does that vary? The way it has worked in the past, and, and I'm not sure it necessarily works this way right now. Um, I took over from Bob Heine, as I said, mm -hmm. and he resigned. He resigned on purpose because that way the officers of the alumni association could appoint who they wanted, select somebody. So it became easier to do it this way and to select who you want and not throw it open to the public, which they, is really what they, they don't sure. want to do. Uh, and in a place like this, uh, you know, we all believe in voting for everybody, but things, that, that's great at some things, but uh, uh, sometimes it has problems too. Indiana is the best example I know. If you go back into their history, that's the way they did it, and it hasn't worked out too, too successfully. Um, I'm not trying to belittle Indiana, but that's just, just not, the way that's it, been that one of their operation. problems down there. Yeah. Anyway, um, we um, um, we were on for three-year terms, and so I finished my I finished Bob Heine's term, which was only a year, I think. Then oh, when you I, first they, got I was just your... appointed again. If you wanted to, as far as I know, you can stay on as long as you want if you've asked to be reappointed, unless there's something gone wrong, of course. But it's worked that way. All the people have been on for quite a while. And so I asked for a, a reappointment three times. And uh, so that's uh, uh, 12 years plus a year, 13. And then I asked for a reappointment for the fourth time and said, I am going to resign after a year. And I'm it was two years. I'm a little hazy whether I said one year or two years to make any difference. Anyway, I was on 14 years total. And I resigned and, and uh, you know, I was trying to think about that last night. Who, who was appointed to take my place? And I'm not sure I can tell you. I, it might have been John Harden. John Harden's still on the, uh, he's vice chairman of the board right now. Uh -huh. And I remember I spent a lot of time talk with, talking with Harden at the time, and I kind of think he was the one that was taking my place. Uh -huh. But I might have been wrong. Sure. But okay. that's the way it was done. Right. And, that's, okay. and, and after 14 years, frankly, that's a lot of time. That's a long time. Uh, yeah. it's, it's a big time commitment for anybody, especially if you're trying to run a business right. and do other things on the outside. I know right. at one time I was president of the local hospital, and, and and on the board of trustees at Purdue and trying to run my business. And believe me, it was not fun. I was going to ask you, um, you have been a lot of activities. You've been involved within the state, within uh, Lafayette, too, as well. And you That's still right. continue to do some <coughs> of those? Um, not now. I don't. Okay. I'm, I'm retired now, and I really try to get out of all that. And I'm involved in uh, uh, some financial things, uh, a couple of foundations. One Fred Ford and I are involved with Westminster here, here in town, and there's a lot of Purdue retirees out there, and a lot of friends that both of us have sure. there, and uh, and we've got a board out there, and, and <laughs> you look around the board, there's 
several of us were all at the trustees' meetings. <laughs> Small world, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. oh, well, a couple things. You got uh, you gotten some awards, Sagamore the Wabash, uh, which is very nice, and, uh -huh. and couple some other ones too. How did that come about? Did, uh, well, the governor, I I got one from. Uh, uh, by I know was the last one, and there was the the one before him was. Uh, Is that Or? Was it Or? Yeah, or? yeah, uh, Or. Uh huh. He gave me one, and then By gave me one. Was there a special ceremony? Did they give you a call, or how did that? Sometimes people are quite surprised because I've asked. Oh yeah, you, you, uh, there was. I think it's some dinner or something Purdue had. By they, uh, you know, they they called me up and said, "We've got an award for you." <laughs> You're with your name on it, right? <laughs> with my name on it. My, and the second one was really a surprise. The one from from uh, from Doctor from uh, uh, Bai, that one. Uh, the second, yes. The second. Yeah. Uh, one thing I want to talk about Bai okay. because this is very interesting for the history. I think. Okay. The the state would then appoint the all the other trustees. Uh, except, oh, except the uh, the student, but the student would really. The, the president would select the student, then the president would tell the governor, here's the one we want. And I think maybe sometimes they gave him two choices, I'm not sure. Anyway, um, that's the way it was done. And the rest of the people had to be Indiana residents. And that worked fine. And Bai changed it. And I think it's, when you think about it, it it's it, from a historical standpoint, it worked out great that he changed it so anybody in the country could be on the board of trustees. You didn't even have to be a graduate of Purdue. You know, we had Emerson Campen, who was the CEO of uh, Great Lakes Chemical here, and he graduated from Michigan. And he was on the board of trustees in Indiana, and then he came to Purdue. And I always ask him how that happened. He says, well, they made a mistake when they put me on <laughs> Indiana. They thought that's what a one I ought to be on. <laughs> That's what he told me. <laughs> and I think maybe it really happened that way. <laughs> but anyway. These things do happen like These that. things do happen. And so um, by uh, the word was, was at the time, he decided that it should be opened up to people outside the state. Now, he was right in, in doing this. But they said he did it because his father wanted to be on the board of trustees, and his father graduated from Purdue, and his father had been former senator by uh, Birch by Birch by, yeah, and he was a well-known Purdue, and and he wanted he was very interested in the job, till he found out how much time it took, and he didn't want to fly back and forth from <laughs> Washington D.C. Uh, and spend that much time at it, so he he didn't do it that, uh, that way. Interesting, that's yeah. uh, You've been pretty active in. I'm sorry. Three five minutes. Okay. Um, I got a, we got one hour. Tell us, uh, let me, before I summary, any favorite traditions that you have of Purdue, like Boilermaker or any of the standard the traditions and you think of a favorite tradition of Purdue? Well, yeah, the, the uh, bell tower. Okay. Because uh, I was in the class in 1948 and Joe Rudolph and I and the class president uh, were the ones that thought up the now, I say we thought up the bell tower. Somebody said that I was the one that suggested it. It really wasn't me. It really came through the university. Uh, I think Chuck Wise said something to me about it, and I went to the, our little luncheon meeting one day and said, Chuck said it would be great if we put a, had a bell tower. And anyway, that's what we settled on. Well, as, as we started to raise money for the bell tower, we had a lot of people from the class of 48 that said, that's the dumbest thing we ever heard of. Who wants to put money into a bell tower? <laughs> and uh, we had a lot of people that felt that way. Well, after we got it built, we even had some people that wouldn't give to it, wanted to come back and give money to it. They thought, that is great. And of course, now everything you see at Purdue has got the bell tower on it. Right. Right. Joe Rudolph talks even even today, he'll say, "Have you seen how many times the bell tower is on all of our literature at Purdue?" Okay. So it took it, it really. Uh, that's the reason the university wanted it, and I think Steve Berry had a lot to do with that, because he became very interested in it, and he was they were building it right outside his office, and right. he was watching it all the time, and we would sometimes meet over there and see how they were coming along on the construction. Sure. Yeah. And the poor contractor, he didn't have a chance with everybody around his. <laughs> around him all the time. Uh, 
How about one of your, um, an outstanding event in your life or a, a, f a favorite memory of Purdue or a long memory of Purdue? In some well, way? I think the bell tower really is okay. a, a, quite a successful uh, memory. Yes. Uh -huh. Anything that I didn't ask that you'd like, in summary, any, anything specific? One thing I forgot, I was going to ask, you've always been involved in the Boy Scouts and still, are you still involved with oh, the... Oh, I still the, am. Are you still on that foundation? And they've I'm, given you several awards. Yes, uh-huh. Right. Yeah, I am and I still am. And we just met two weeks ago. That's nice to, because that's a long, goes way back in time. Yes, uh-huh. Yeah, well, I was a Boy Scout as a boy. That, that's a good for starters, yeah. yes. Okay, anything that, in closing, anything special that you'd like to say? No, oh, I think that's, I've covered about everything I can think of. I want to thank you very much on behalf of the You're library welcome. for yeah. this. My Glad pleasure. to do it.